folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to uh, Crowdsurfing. This is a show where we talk about Kickstarter and the different things that are on Kickstarter and the projects that are there, which in the month of January isn't really usually a ton until the end. Then the projects come out in full force. So there's a lot of news to talk about. Our own Kickstarter is ending today. Um, so I guess I should mention that first. If you haven't yet backed it and you're interested in it, today's the day to do it. Stop this video, go do it, then come back. Because there's a lot of other cool Kickstarters. Let's take a look. So, man. There's so many huge Kickstarters on, on uh, Kickstarter right now. Let's get started with Nemesis. Nemesis is from the same folks who made Lords of Hellas. Our review of that just went up yesterday. That game did phenomenal. This is another one. This is a semi-co-op, which gives me some pause. I'm hoping this one is really good, but we'll have to wait and see. But the, it looks basically like Aliens, like the movie. There's big Aliens. You're, the miniatures are great. This is a co-production between Awaken Realms and Rebel Games, both good companies. Awaken Realms does these amazing things. So this game is just doing phenomenally on Kickstarter, but it just looks neat. And it looks like it kind of gives you that dread of being on a ship with these nasty aliens, especially with as big, as big these miniatures are. Hate! Ah, uh, from CMON, this is a game, I mean, this is a trailer which, I mean, the, the trailer for this one is one of the silliest trailers I've ever seen. This game has been getting a lot of hate, but at the same time, it's doing really well. I mean, it's not doing as well as many other CMON projects, but 750k, when I looked at it last, it's nothing to scoff at. This is a mature rated game. Uh, in this game, you have these guys running around in a world filled with hate, fighting each other, uh, stealing each other, cooking each other, eating each other. It's a, definitely a very heavy theme based on a comic book series. Red Dragon Inn 7 Tavern Crew. This is a standalone expansion for Red Dragon Inn. At this point, you're getting it because you like Red Dragon Inn. Um, or you're not because you don't. I mean, it, it's very similar to the base game. Just adds more characters, so on and so forth. Goblin Corsairs, this is a group, a, um, a faction for a miniatures game called Hungry Trolls. They don't actually show the miniatures though, they just show pictures of it, but I guess that's enough for most people who, I guess you have to like the game. It doesn't even talk about the game in a Kickstarter, it just says it's an expansion for this, I had to go hunt it down on my own. Hermetica, um, this is a two-player abstract strategy game with no luck, um, which many abstract strategy games are. I like the look of this one. I like the hexagon board. They say every game is different, which is really not a huge selling point since most games are different every time you play them. But it just has a neat look to it, and there's not many abstract strategy games that make it to Kickstarter, so I hope this one does well. The next one was almost my Kickstarter pick of the week because it just looks so neat. That's Deja Vu Fragments of Memory. Everything about this game is something I'm like, woo, uh, new, unique, interesting theme. Great components, fantastic artwork, and a Mancala-like um, thing. You're getting skills. And, oh, man, just the whole thing looks great production. It's from Hysteria. Now, I did play their last Kickstarter game. I have not uh, posted my review of it yet because I disliked it so much. That was Fallen Angel. I'll probably review it at some point. This wasn't a very good game. Um, but it was a neat theme and unique idea, too. This one looks like it's a better game, though. This just looks, wow, oh, man, this one really looks phenomenal. Then we have the Rogue set. This is another set of uh, Polyhero dice. It's funny, this one is doing really, really well, and they've all done pretty well. Everyone I've talked to about these dice say they're really cool. I'm like, do you use them? No, they're not very good dice, but they look cool. So just keep that in mind. Tiny Epic Zombies, blowing up, of course, as all the Tiny Epic games do. When I first heard about this, my actual reaction was Tiny Epic Zombies. Man, of all the themes I didn't want. But it does look pretty interesting. It looks very similar to Tiny Epic Quest in that they're jamming a ton in that box where when you put it on the table, it's not tiny at all. Um, and it has the item meeples that they also had in Tiny Epic Quest where you'd be able to like stick little axes and chainsaws and things on your meeples as you fight the zombies. I'm sure this one will be a big hit. Neanderthal and Greenland are both together on Kickstarter. These are from Sierra Madre. These are the second printings. Now, many people haven't heard of Sierra Madre games. They make fairly heavy games. These are lighter than some of Phil Eklund, the designer's fair, but they're still pretty involved. I played uh, I one Sierra Madre game and it took three and a half hours. These are maybe shorter than that and they look fantastic. These second printings look great. But he, uh, one thing for sure about Phil is he puts a lot of history and a lot of science and a lot of like realism in his games. 
And both of these games uh, have been very well received, so people should be excited about those coming back. Calliope has the Mansky Caper. This is a press your luck style game where the boss, Mr. Mansky, or, or Boss Mansky, I guess is out of town and you are now, the cat's away, the mice will play type thing, and you're gonna push your luck until there's some sort of explosion. The components look great, the game looks great. It's from Ken Franklin, I looked him up, I can't find really any other board games that he's done. But just based on looks alone, and Calliope makes usually light, fun games, so this one is one I'm interested in. The Last Stand. This here, um, it's it power, your power grows as you lose. Okay, I'm curious to see how that will work. Uh, this one here has uh, artwork from a webcomic called Safely Endangered. I can't really tell from it. Looks a little like a take that game, but maybe it with differences. So we'll have to wait and see till the final product comes out. Eagle has a new game, the Scarlet Pimpernel, where you, it's a, it's, it looks like a co-op game like you're all, the Scarlet Pimpernel fighting against the, the ruling class and standing for the common man. It comes with a little guillotine. <laughs> so there's that, a guillotine piece. But you are, it's, even though you're like all working together to help the revolution per se, it's one person wins, they are the trusted advisor. Lots of pieces, a lot of stuff going on. This one looks really intriguing. Dice boxes. This one is not really doing that well in Kickstarter, but I think they look cool. This guy is making custom dice boxes to hold your dice. I like how they look. Check them out. America Falling. This is a post-apocalyptic game, and this is a heavier style Euro. I mean, not heavier style Euro game. Heavier style war game from one small step. So there, it's, it's in the future. There are two factions, red versus blue. But they're very careful that these could be, you could be all different sorts of red factions. You could be the Texas Liberation Faction or different things. The, so the red is conservative, blue, liberal, but it's not necessarily where conservative and liberal are today. It's the future in different factions. Probably out of my realm of games I'm interested in playing, but heavier war games, and if you like that possible future type stuff, this will really appeal to you. U-Boot, this is my Kickstarter pick of the week. This game looks phenomenal. Um, this is a cooperative, real-time game that uses an app, but what really got me on board was you're all members of a, a submarine trying to keep the submarine going. That's great. There's an actual physical submarine in the middle of the table, and you're moving pieces around as 3D submarine. Ah, oh, with the app, with the real-time. Oh, I'm really excited about this one. Like. I was like, mm, which one am I gonna pick for my Kickstarter of the week? When I saw this, boom, it was over. Um, I'm very pumped about this one. This one is from Phalanx. So I don't know how complex it is. The last game I, that they did, I think, was Hannibal versus uh, Rome versus Carthage. But still, I know that they also have a lot of historical, so you know this is gonna be historically accurate type stuff in this game. Oof, looks good. Seize the Bean. This is a lighthearted deck builder about Berlin. You are a barista in Berlin, trying to get the best reviews. This looks like a throwback now to a very straightforward deck building game, and the card artwork is clean and nice and cartoony and stuff. I like the theme and the components look cool, so hopefully this one is fun. Dead Men Tell No Tales. Z loves this game, Sam and I both also enjoy it. Um, and now is an expansion for the Kraken, because it wasn't enough that your ship was burning and that there were ghost pirates on it and all kinds of bad things. Now there's a Kraken with miniatures, so of course this one's gonna do well. Warp Gate. This is Conquer the Galaxy in less than an hour. Heard that one before. And that's really, when I look at Warp Gate, it looks nice, looks interesting. But what is differentiating this one? And they're swearing it takes less than an hour with two players. I guess that goes up to 90 minutes with four. There's no player elimination. There's no downtime. You're forced to attack other players. You can't sit in the corner. All this stuff sounds good. If they hold true to those promises, I'm on board. Until then, though, it does look a little generic -y for a space game. But if it does all those things, it could be one I really enjoy. Valeria Card Kingdom's Shadow Veil. This includes werewolves and bad guys and vampires, oh my. And also a little relics expansion for Valeria Card Kingdoms. And finally, Hentes, or Gentes, I think it's Hentes. This is a heavier Euro style game, uh, which um, oh, the guys in my group who are heavy Euro gamers, they were like, this game's amazing. Okay, great. Then that means I don't know that I'm gonna like it. It might be at my wheelhouse, however, Tasty Minstrel's doing this one. They're deluxifying it, which means the components are gonna be amazing. And lately, Tasty Minstrel's been almost on a 100% hit rate for me with their new games that they've been doing. So I'm definitely gonna take a look at this one when it comes out. Whew, that is a lot of stuff. 
Let's keep going. Hey friends, and welcome to another segment of FOMO, where I'm gonna take a look at a game that I have a fear of missing out on and haven't decided if I'm gonna back yet. And maybe you're in the same position. Well, today we're gonna take a look at Rambo the Board Game. Rambo the Board Game is a tactical, cooperative, mission-based game for one to four players where you will all be taking on the roles of Rambo or other characters from the movies. The game comes with operation packs that will have between one and five missions in a campaign style of play. Now these will give you an objective and set up information. In addition, completing missions will award you with new gear and tactics to level up your heroes for their next missions. At the start of every round, players will decide on a stance to take for that round, which will affect their movement, actions, and momentum gained for their turn. In addition, each player selects a tactics card that can be used for its benefit or exhausted right away to gain a momentum token. At the start of a player's turn, they first need to resolve a threat card. Now, these cards will activate possibly some enemies on the board and have other effects listed on them. Then the player takes their turn using movement and actions in any order they see fit. When a player steps into an area with an unrevealed Fog of War card, they must flip it over, resolving any text and spawning enemies listed on that card. Enemies are labeled in such a way that they can be referenced and their status tracked for as long as they remain in play. Whenever a player moves into a cover space on the board, they must roll the hazard die to check against the current hazard table. Now, combat in the game is straightforward with gear stating range, number of enemies hit, damage, and how much it adds to the player's alert status. When attacking an enemy, you simply compare the damage given out to the armor value of the target, and any damage over the armor is placed on the target. Damage always, however, carries a minimum of one, so even if the armor exceeds the damage value, at least one damage will still happen. Enemy activations, when they happen due to threat cards or other events, will follow the text printed on the card for that particular enemy type. When enemies attack a player, it uses the same rules for combat as when players attack enemies. Enemies who have met or exceeded their damage value are removed from the board. Players who meet or exceed their damage value, however, will instead take a wound token, which must be placed over their leftmost available stance, making it unavailable for the remainder of the game. Once all players have taken their turn, they will exhaust the tactic card they've used and prepare for a new round with the current leader deciding who will start the next round of play. Players continue working together until either they succeed or fail the mission they're on. If at any point a hero has taken four wounds, then the players must retreat and have failed that mission. If on the other hand, players manage to complete the objective, then they are successful and follow the victory text of the mission and prepare for the next one. So that's a brief look at Rambo the board game. Now I didn't cover everything, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how the game plays. What you saw in there was a preview copy, and as such those are prototype components, and doesn't inc necessarily include final artwork and final balancing or rules, and most importantly it didn't include the miniatures. And if you want to take a look at the miniatures, I would advise going over and looking at their Kickstarter page. As to the gameplay itself, well, this game is Rambo, and it feels like Rambo. It's a tactical skirmish game that also feels like a dungeon crawl. In addition to Rambo, the game kind of made me feel like Metal Gear Solid, because I could go as a group into our mission guns blazing, but I also could get a little more snake-like and be more stealth. And I did enjoy how the game allows me to make those decisions, and some missions it honestly works better. As to everything else within the game, I did enjoy the legacy campaign style. It's not a legacy game, but I like that as I complete missions, I was able to unlock new gear and traits and disperse them among the characters, allowing them to feel like they are evolving within a storyline. I also really did enjoy the fact that this game can play solo, and I mean it truly can play solo. I could choose one character and play through it. Now, one thing that was a pro for me that I know some people may take issue with is the combat. The combat in this game is deterministic. I already know the outcome when I go to do it. For me, I like that. I don't like the randomness, but I can definitely see how some people might prefer chucking dice. The only negative for me in this game, and it's not really negative, it's more of a thing I would like to see, is the option for a fifth player to control the enemies. Now, I think the AI in this game is good, and I like the way it works out, and it, it works well, but I always like the option for a player to take control of them. These are going to be my FOMO scores for the game, and this is a game that I'm going to keep a close eye on. I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at Rambo the Board Game, and it's helped you decide if this is a game that you don't want to miss out on. And I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Hey folks, Mark here, and welcome back to another Dice Tower Preview Recap. Randy and I recently took a look at some new projects on Kickstarter. Now, these are paid previews, and it's our hope that we give you a real sense of each game. First up, we have Hermetica, 
Hermetica is a strategy game where you try to move your main player piece, known as the Adept, across the board and into your opponent's base or horizon. Your Adept is aided by a series of elements, all with unique movement and abilities. True to their namesake, fire, water, and earth will all aid you in your quest to claim victory. The game also features barriers, which in turn change up the playing field for a unique gaming experience each time. Easy to learn, but lots to master. Randy and I really enjoyed this one. Hermetica is for one to two players and brought to you by IFF Studios. Next up we have Lurana Age of Kingdoms. Age of Kingdoms is an epic fantasy 4x board game where players lead the nations of Lurana in their quest to earn the favor of the gods. As powerful magic wielding rulers, players will fight, trade, and spell sling their way into the gods good graces in their race to earn the most glory. The game features beautiful artwork, strategic decision making, and a big epic gaming experience. Age of Kingdoms is for 2-6 to six players and brought to you by ODM Publishing. For more details on each of the games mentioned here, please check out our full previews and see if these games might be a good fit for you. And if you are interested in having your game featured as a Dice Tower preview, please reach out to Tom or myself. And keep an eye out for more previews in the near future. All right, folks, until next time, we'll see you at the table. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the Dice Tower, as of me recording this, has, I think, 36 hours ago. By the time you see this, we're down to 12 hours or whatever. Not much time left. The last 48 hours of a Kickstarter are extremely nerve-wracking. And it's that way for a few reasons. One, 48 hours before a Kickstarter ends, Kickstarter sends a message out to everybody saying, hey, 48 hours, it's almost over. Congrats, you know, whatever, whatever. This is for people who watch it. Some people will watch a Kickstarter. They don't necessarily back it. Then they get the message in their email and they're like, okay, now's the time to back this. And this is why when you watch a Kickstarter, you will see at the end, there's always an upward trend. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is there are people who are just watching it saying, hmm, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and it gets to the end, they're like, ah, ah. And this is why auctions do so well, right? Someone's sitting there going, 20, going once, going twice, and you're like, ah, ah, okay, 25. And so the same thing happens here. Now, it also happens in a negative way where people pull their pledges, and a lot of people are like, ah, ah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, that's a lot of money, okay, I'm out. And I talked about that last week, how that can be problematic and such, but there's also good things. So the last 48 hours are extremely tense for the Kickstarter creator because you're watching your amounts go do, 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 and it usually goes up to some degree. Now, some people are like hoping for that 48 hour window to save their Kickstarter campaign. But at this point in time, uh, with enough Kickstarter data, usually a Kickstarter campaign, you can tell early on if it's gonna cross that line. Now, there are a few that stagger across the line at the end, but for the most part, they're gonna make it or they're going not, and if they haven't made it by the 48 hour mark and they're still good distance off, that's usually not enough to save them. And I would caution any Kickstarter uh, from coming in and saying, look at all this great stuff we're going to offer you if you, we make it to the end. Don't tank your company just to make that goal. And then you sit there and you probably will watch it and I will probably stay up till midnight uh, when the Kickstarter, our Kickstarter ends and watch it to see where it ends. And that's exciting and all that jazz. And then the work begins. Uh, there's more to Kickstarter than just running the project. Actually, most of the work, as I said, comes before, some during the project for communication and all, and then at the end, there's a little bit. But we'll talk about that next time. Meanwhile, let's listen to someone way smarter than me about Kickstarter. Jamie over at Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm gonna to talk about the anatomy of a great Kickstarter project page. There's a lot to cover here, um, so I'd recommend checking out my blog for all the different things. Go to kickstarterlessons.com and look at all the little entries about the project page, but I'll summarize some key points here. A combination of two entries, the anatomy of a project, great Kickstarter project page, and what backers see. I've done an extensive poll about what backers actually look at and are interested in on a project page. So one of the first things they see is the main project image. Um, which is probably the, the most important image on the page. So the first thing people see, it's the image that's used um, over overlapping the video and on the project page and as a thumbnail elsewhere. So you need to make sure it's an image that works big and small. I recommend keeping it 
uh, clean and simple and distinctive. So highlight uh, a 3D image of the game box and maybe a really, if you have a really cool component in the game that you want to highlight, you can put that in the foreground near the game box. I also like to put what day it is of the campaign on that image and I update that every day because sometimes backers, it's really hard to see on the project page what day it is. So if you give them that information, then they have it and they can, they can make assumptions about that information once they see it. Um, the what's in the box image is incredibly important and it's, this is something I put usually right at the top of the project page. It gives backers an, a picture of uh, what the game will look like on the table and how much stuff, how much cool stuff they're getting in the box, as well as a clear view of the quality of the art and the graphic design. Backers like to see the stretch goal chart on the project page. This is one of the, the most highly voted things on the poll that I ran. Um, so put that stretch goal part, uh, chart somewhere on the page, ideally pretty high up on the page so backers can see uh, how much new stuff has been added to the game and what can be added if you reach other stretch goals. Also important to backers is the written description of the game, and I break this into two parts. One is that little line, the two, uh, line, uh, two lines of text that appear right below the main project image or video, and I recommend putting in that line the player count, uh, the type of game it is, and the playing time. So for example, you might say Pandemic is a one to four player cooperative game that plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. That gives players, or a lot of people, all the core information they need to make a decision about the game. And then if they want, they can read a little bit more in a more detailed description. And for any paragraph on the project page, I recommend keeping it to three lines or less. People, on, when they read online, they tend to skim a lot. And so if you keep paragraphs nice and short, they're much more likely to read the whole thing and get that important information, rather than if you give them a big block of text to work through. Last, I highly recommend, as we've talked about before, getting some third-party reviews, both written podcast and video reviews, somewhere on the project page, probably right below the stretch goal chart or right above the stretch goal chart. There's lots of other stuff that goes on the project page, so check out the blog at, at kickstarterlessons.com, but this is some of the core content that you need to start thinking about. Thanks. Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with another episode of Kickstarter on Yop. That's right. I'll bring you projects that won't break your budget, but throw in a little something extra. Here's what caught my eye this week. I've been checking out a new project from Godhead Games called Street Rod. I was fascinated with racing games back when I was a kid uh, on the Trash 80 and uh, Atari 2600 and my Apple IIe. There weren't a lot of great games, but we played them when we could find them. Looks like the design team at Godhead Games, they like street racing too, as they've licensed an old street racing game to bring it to tabletop. In Street Rod, it's the summer of 63, the Beach Boys are on the radio singing Surfing USA, and you've got just enough money to buy a car and trick it out for some racing. The game plays from one to five players, or up to 10 if you combine two decks, and takes about 30 minutes to finish. Players start with $500, and they'll use that money to buy a car, and then outfit it with tires and engine parts, whatever's gonna rev up the engine. These cards form your starting hand. Next up, you'll buy some additional car parts from the deck, basically a market, to customize your car further, and then it's time to race. Challenge one of the available 16 opponents or one of the, your game buddies to score points. Sure, your car may not be the fastest yet, but the designers have added a little bit of chaos. The bad luck indicator card, which gives you a chance to pull out the victory. Each round, you'll go back to the market. You can head back to the store for cars and parts or trade in those car parts you really didn't need for extra cash. The designers have uploaded a rule book to the Kickstarter site if you want to check it out for yourself. Hey, let's check it out. The, let's check out the pledge levels. For $13, you can get the base game, it's called the Drag Race level, in a no frills tuck box package, or up your pledge to $17 to get a traditional long box. And there's a little bit of line yop. The end of each race is a little math heavy, adding up all the different points and bonuses and minuses based on the track, your car, the opponents, your parts, and the bad luck indicator but the designers have included a free app that does all the calculations for you and declares the winner. The downside, <clears throat> I grew up in the era when most computer games actually had these kind of graphics. And the reason was because of the limited by today's standards, computing power in our trash 80s and our Vic 20s. So the pixel graphics nature of some parts of the game, it's not my favorite. 
but it's really a small part of the game and wouldn't stand in my way. As for the Kickstarter project itself, the game has already met its funding and all of its stretch goals. So to recap, for 13 bucks, you get the base game and the tuck box, or you can spend a little bit extra for $17 to get a traditional long box. And either pledge level is going to get you some Lanyap, a free app to handle the in-game scoring. So that's Street Rod out on Kickstarter right now. What do you think of the game? Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, les le bon temps roulé. Well, that's it, folks. Another crowd surfing episode. Thanks so much for watching. Check out all these projects. We mentioned a whole lot there. If you back to Dice Tower Kickstarter, I want to say a huge thank you to you. But right now, we need to get going. More videos coming up on the Dice Tower, reviews and stuff. Check all of them out. Until next time, I'm Tom Bassel, and you've been watching Crowd Surfing. Yeah.